I V M. Hello and welcome to the Habit Coach Podcast. I am Ashton Doctor, your Habit Coach, and today we have a very interesting episode. We are going to be talking about the brain and habits. How does the brain form habits? But more interestingly, how do habits form as you age and your different life cycles? So we have a very dear friend and an amazing guest with us. We have Sid Warrior on the Happy Coach Podcast. Sid, welcome to the Happy Coach Podcast. Thank you so much, Ashton. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here. So exciting yeah. because the brain is fascinating. Right? How did you get involved in this? Tell us your story. Well, I'll compress 15 years into one minute. Hmm. Um, became a doctor at the age of um, 18. Went into MBBS. Uh, did my MBBS, MD, and then specialized in neurology. Uh, finished that in 2019. Uh, thought I'll be practicing as a doctor full time. Then COVID happened. Got into content creation. Uh, then I realized that there's a lot of neuroscience that people wanted to know and should know. Hmm. And uh, currently what i what i do is i teach people about their own brains because i believe it's um hak banta hai it's everybody has the right to know why they are the way they are what is happening in their brains and uh, as you said habit building is the cornerstone of you know our behavior and there's a lot to learn about how the brain learns to form a new habit how did you get interested in the brain to choose that as a speciality uh it started off with my interest in psychology actually okay. i got interested in behavior about understanding why people behave the way they do mm-hmm. and initially i started reading about psychology sort of abstract things like hypnosis and um, gradually i went deeper and deeper and realized that oh all these things are coming from the brain you know certain networks in the brain certain chemicals acting at certain junctions and that is what leads to thoughts to actions so i got really curious about the hard solutions mm. you know what is the root cause of it all and that's what led me to neurology very interesting yeah uh, you know when we think about the brain we think of it as this mysterious object yeah. right like we're still like scratching the surface on how things are happening in it before we jump into this conversation i had a uh, question that just popped into my mind which was that are there things that now we are discovering about the brain where we thought this is what the brain did but it actually doesn't necessarily do that anymore other parts of the body take over or things like that like are we learning new it, roles yeah it has been a constant journey of realizations as far as neuroscience is concerned um because around maybe 200 300 years ago we didn't even know how important the brain was right um even the term hysteria for example uh it used to be called hysteria because people thought that it's the cause of that kind of behavior is the uterus correct the history um so now we know that all behavior comes from the brain uh and then the entire focus shifted into the brain we thought that everything comes from the brain now we realize that's not also true mm-hmm. there is um, behavior that is learned at the spinal level also there's behavior that is learned at the brain stem level also um our understanding today is growing to the extent that we realize even the gut has its own scot and coat brain correct so that's called as the second brain um so there's a lot of cognition that happens in the gut at the local level uh, so our understanding keeps growing ask me this question again in 10 years and i might have a on the next answer. episode so <laughs> the habit coach <laughs> but that's fascinating right because yeah. you're at a field which is constantly changing and evolving i think yeah. that is the best habits habits yeah so now tell me habits and the brain what is the scene that is taking place in the brain when it comes to habits mm, when we talk about a habit essentially the concept is our brain has learned a certain response to a certain stimulus mm. that's what it is and over time that learning becomes more and more ingrained so our voluntary choice reduces so there are habits that are so deeply ingrained that we now call it a reflex a reflex mm. but at one point it wasn't a reflex at one point it was a learning mm. so a reflex arc is when there is an input and there's an output mm. that's it no thinking mm. so that's what we call a knee reflex so if you hit a hammer on the knee okay. a lightly a light hammer then uh, your knee jerks mm. that's a knee reflex that at one point was a learning some microorganism you know 4 billion years ago figured out that uh, if something is attacking you just kick hmm. 
just react. Correct. And that is that learning that evolved over billions of years to form our knee reflex. Hmm. Um, as evolution kept growing, that complexity of those learnings kept increasing. But at the core of it, it's still the same. We learn from our experience and that learning becomes more and more and more ingrained into our biology until it becomes a habit. Uh, so that's the that's the crux of it. So now if um, like I know somebody knocks me on the knee, my knee, uh, my leg flies out. Yeah. It was something that an ancestor of mine learned. Yeah. But my ancestor also learned not to touch fire yeah. and things like that. Right. Yeah. Why aren't those things that are already built into us? Why do we have to go through the process of burning our hands to know Acha fire is hot? Like, why, why doesn't it get passed down to us? So it's like interesting that, that uh, when you say fire, fire is both a bad thing, but it is also a very good thing. Mm. Because we are more scared of the dark than we are scared of fire. Mm. So our fear of darkness is more ingrained in us than our fear of fire. Mm. So we would prefer to be with fire. So the burning is better than the darkness. The darkness, hmm. exactly. Because more more bad things have happened in the dark huh. than have happened in when the, we had fire with us. Burning us up. So that's why we are attracted towards fire. Hmm. In fact, we want to be around fire more. Even that a little jerk that we get hmm. when we sleep sometimes, hmm. is called a myoclonic jerk, right. where you think that you, just when you're about to fall asleep, you might have this jerking reaction in your whole body. Correct. That is our vestibular system testing itself hmm. that if you were to fall, would you be able to balance yourself? Ah. And as your consciousness goes down while you're sleeping, it reaches that level and it just tests if are you still able hmm. to do that? And then it, you fall asleep. So that's a very normal reaction. But that is also a habit that our body has learned over time. It's interesting. So, so, so habits now, if I wanted to form, right? Like yeah. where in the brain do your habits live? Is there a particular place that they live? And right. Do you access them? How do you use um, that? The way I see it is, suppose if there is a, if there's a building, mm. say uh, 10 floors, mm. right? And the 10th floor is the one that got built most recently. All habits will start forming from the 10th floor onwards. Okay. Okay. So assume that all information comes in and the 10th floor is our prefrontal cortex. Mm. That is our logical thinking brain. Um, and that is where the habit formation starts. So the 10th floor people will say that, okay, from tomorrow onwards, I want to go to the gym every day. Mm. But the 10th floor is easily distracted. So, you know, so tomorrow something else will come. There's a new movie and they might not Gym's go to the gym. Yeah, correct. But the lower down that decision goes, the more likely it is that you will do it. So, for example, breathing is in the basement. Mm. Heartbeats are in the basement. Mm. You can't even reach there. Correct. Uh, brushing your teeth in the morning is probably in the first or second floor. Mm. Even if you're not thinking much, you'll still go and brush your teeth. Uh, but eating healthy or going to the gym is on the terrace. Mm. <laughs> it, it, not gonna happen. It's not going to happen. Mm. Unless you keep on doing it and then the more you do it, the lower down it goes. So there is this critical level hmm. beyond which you don't need to worry about it because your limbic system or the lower floors of the building have now taken it over. Hmm. But it is a lot of effort to push that decision to that level because there is a lot of energy spent. Right. And ironically, any decision that the upper levels have to take is where energy is used the most. Hmm. The lower level decisions are effortless. But our brain is very selective in what it allows into the lower levels. Mm. Because, you know, you, you, you would probably be doing that for the rest of your life. Mm. So our brain is very selective. So there's a lot of effort in the above floors, very little effort in the lower floors, but it's difficult to get something there to the lower floor. And then once it's there, it is relatively permanent. Yes. Difficult to move out. Very difficult to move out because then it becomes part of our reflex actions. Hmm. So from a neuroscience point of view, habit change, hmm. because most of us think of habit is in the form of habit change. Like we right. either want a new habit or you want to replace an old habit. You know, we, we're not really worried about what habits we have currently and that we're happy with. Yeah. We always want change. So changing from a neuroscience point of view, how does that work? There are three things that you have to do. Hmm. Uh, very, you know, roughly speaking, um, the three things are what is motivating, mm -hmm. what is, or rather what is pulling you, what is pushing you and what is keeping you. 
So I like to think of it in these three sections. Mm. So if you have to form a new habit, um, what is pulling you? So what is your motivation that makes you want to do it? What is pushing you? So what are you going away from? What are you afraid of if you don't do it? Mm. And once you start, what will keep you? Right. Because both the pull and the push would eventually go away. Mm. Because you might figure out that, oh, it's not as worth as I thought. And the fear is not as great as I thought. Mm. So both of them kind of cancel out after some time. The best example would be if you start going to the gym, what is pulling you? You want to look good. You want to have abs. You want to get healthy. What is pushing you? You don't want to, you know, become unhealthy. You want, you want your clothes to fit. You don't want people to judge you, all that. But eventually as you grow, both of those motivations might go. So what is keeping you mm. doing it? Mm. That is the third section. Right. And that's where people, I feel put in less time mm. in thinking. But that is the one that is most important. So some kind of uh, accountability partners, uh, some tracker that you have, right. uh, something that needs to happen for you to keep doing it. Yeah, uh, That is probably the most important step. So so in the habit formation thing, like in fact, in the book and stuff, we call it intention setting. Hmm. So what is the actual intention behind this? So after you go past the surface level stuff. Hmm. The problem with forming a new habit is that most people are not honest with themselves. Hmm. You would like to believe that you are this person, but you are not. Yeah. And uh, until you are that person, it will be very difficult to form that new habit. Correct. So we feel that starting a new habit will make you that person, but it's actually the other way around. Mm. Be that person and then the habit will just then fall. Then the habit. Correct. So that identity has to be formed first. Mm. The way I see it is um, putting a jigsaw puzzle in its place. Mm. You have to create that place first. Mm. Otherwise, you're trying to force a piece that doesn't fit. So if you become the kind of person who is healthy, then obviously everything else will come into the picture. Mm. Whether uh, And being healthy does not have anything to do with how what you look like or what your weight is or whether you have abs. Correct. But is your mentality like somebody who is healthy? Mm. Not somebody who wants to be healthy. Yeah, who is currently who healthy. Who is currently healthy. Yes. And then... All the habits will be easier to form, mm. but uh, people get it reversed, yeah. and that is a bigger struggle. Okay, so we were going to talk about the journey of habits through our life cycle. Yeah. Children and habits, right? Mm. Like, when do kids start picking up habits? Do they start, like, the time they are born, do they have any habits? Yeah. Oh, like, what is the process? So, we are born with a few habits already, okay? Right? So, we call them uh, child reflexes. Mm. So, there are a lot of things that children do instinctively. Um, like spread their arms out when their head is falling back. Mm. It's an instinctive response. It's called Moro's reflex. Mm. And that's something that we do to children to see if their um, you know, brain and the spinal cord are intact. Right. So you just drop a kid gently, you know, two, three inches mm. and their arms and legs and kind flay of out. flay out mm. and then they pull them back in. Mm. So that's the reflex and they are born with it. Right. Uh, there are these milestones that children achieve. So at a particular time, a child will roll over, start crawling. Mm. Nobody tells the child to do this or makes the child do this. This is all very instinctive. So those are habits that a child is already born with. So that those are habits that the neural system has learned. Correct. But when also you say instinct, it's the same thing that we talk about? It's the same thing. Okay. Correct. All inst what, whatever, anything that we attribute to the subconscious mind... Mm say instinct or intuition or impulse all of these are actually habits right that we have learned somewhere without knowing and uh, that we don't have conscious control over mm. uh, so as the child grows what the environment does is it teaches it new habits right uh, so it teaches it that this face mm. is someone that i trust so if this face disappears then you should cry or you should, you know, demand attention from this person. Mm. So these are behavioral habits that the child learns. And then there is uh, habits that you learn because of behavior of other people. So say if there is a four-year-old and uh, he throws a tantrum and he gets something. Now he he's figuring out. He's figuring out how to navigate social circumstances. Right. He's fighting with his brother and his brother hits him. He cries, goes to his mom, complains. Now, you know, that he learns that, oh, this is one way I can navigate mm. it. So every minute, every conversation that the child has, he's learning these new techniques and they all become habits. Some form of trial and error is happening. Correct. Correct. And Correct. this work, this didn't work. This work, this didn't work. Constantly, constantly. Mm. And all parenting 
is about is trying to help a child learn the right ways of navigating the world mm. and there is no perfect way um and there's also no uh, unsolvable mistake mm. so if a child learns something that you think is bad it's not that oh i am now a horrible parent correct i have screwed it up mm. it's not like that because a child will keep learning it will keep learning if he's l- if he's done a good thing today it doesn't mean that you've solved parenthood mm. <laughs> you know, there will I be a mistake best, best parent in the world <laughs> not like that huh? right we are we are always so eager to congratulate ourselves or berate ourselves too quickly right but the beauty of a child's brain is that it will keep on learning and there is something called pruning mm. which i found very fascinating so the way a brain works uh, the way a brain evolves is the periphery which is a neocortex imagine a tree mm. and the tree is constantly growing a branch from there is merging with a branch from here and there are leaves sprouting all over but unregulated growth can become a problem mm. so a large portion of the brain's energy is spent not in creating new branches mm. but cutting off branches that are not needed oh. like mm. a gardener mm. Mm. so literally the brain is going around with scissors chopping off acha i don't need this i don't need this i don't mm. need this mm. this is called pruning if the pruning process does not happen then there will be a lot of unregulated neural network connections mm. and that can lead to chaos so when you say that you know you want clear thinking mm. clarity of thinking you want networks to be connected in a very orderly way mm. right and even when we talk of creativity it's not complete chaos mm. because that is disorganized thought correct and that can be a psychiatric problem you still want some kind of structure some kind of organization so this is best seen in a growing child mm. because in a growing child their imagination is wild mm. they can think of anything correct but m- combining that with so called structured reality that is when the pruning is seen a uh, maximum wow so that is really that's a really beautiful thing because that's how habits are formed because anything is possible but oh let's not form this habit instead let's direct our energies to form this habit instead so it's constantly happening so in fact forgetting is more important than yeah keeping that memory in place absolutely like declutter there's full plot twist <laughs> yeah so decluttering is a, a very big part of the brain constantly our brain is decluttering it's throwing out more stuff than you could ever take in hmm. in fact i think um you are consciously aware of only 13% of information that comes in and that is if you're paying attention right most of the times you're not aware of even that much so then why do we say that we're going to run out of so so why, it's not that we're running out of memory right because like we think of our brain as being far more than we would use in our life yeah yeah absolutely so then why would it keep um it's a misconception hmm. because there's no such thing as finite memory hmm. in fact what happens is that as we evolve we are coming up with better ways of uh, data storage hmm. so even even with technology you would notice that uh, it's it's not that uh, we are running out of space what is happening is that technology is able to compress files better mm. so this whole zip files right. and uh, you know ssd cards so in a smaller space we are able to put in more information mm. that is exactly what the brain is doing it is a biological computer mm. so it figures out how to fold one say gb of space mm. or, or 1 gb of information into say 500 uh, mb correct or if a brain is really good at it mm. it can compress that same information into 1 mb mm. or half an mb so in fact i feel that the difference between people is in how efficiently they can compress information mm. and store information and connect information with each other which is why different people can have different capacities but that is learned right and that's not biological so you'd pick it up as as a habit from somebody else saying right. that this is how you're supposed to be remembering things or memorizing yeah. things etc yeah like a way of learning is also a habit that you pick up correct so different people will learn differently mm. um people who have studied say who have gone into more academic pursuits um so i know that i have had to come up with a lot of ways to remember a lot of information quickly mm. so i have come up with my own ways of doing that whereas somebody else or even somebody who is born today might not put in that much effort into memorization because everything is accessible correct so their effort will grow uh, their brain will grow in the direction of okay let me learn how to quickly utilize 
whatever information is available hmm. so the brain will go in the direction where it needs to interesting yeah so so you'll be learning how to probably make connections of two random thoughts so Better. creativity might be from there instead of just remembering and like we yes. don't remember phone numbers anymore absolutely hmm. whereas somebody say 500 years ago in a gurukul yeah. somewhere yeah. they will be able to remember say 500 books by heart hmm. because that was the only way they couldn't carry it around hmm. and they needed that information uh, so they just needed to by heart it so they will just remember endless poems and songs because that's how they remember uh, information correct yeah so as children we are constantly picking up habits so there are habits that we are born with instincts yeah. and then over a period of time we pick up habits from what we are seeing around us taking place yeah the storage of habits and all of that taking place in the brain is exactly the same way as it happens with ad- adults or is it different yes the basic networks are the same hmm. uh, they go through that same flow chart hmm. our brain takes in information or data uh, it runs it through a filter which involves a few areas so there is an area called thalamus which filters all the senses mm. except smell mm. which goes directly into the brain mm-hmm. everything else uh, is filtered through the thalamus mm. and the thalamus decides oh important not important important not and then it will f- take out say 10% of it and give it to a conscious brain mm. saying these are the things that you should probably look at mm-hmm. everything else don't worry right i have cleared it out you don't need to pay attention to any of that this is happening on a continuous basis every millisecond mm. so even right now right. if you look at the world ac you, humming i'm not ac humming you are not aware mm. some book somewhere you're not aware Correct. but as soon as i say it now it comes into focus right. so our brain is constantly picking out parts of our reality to bring to our attention but smell would always be in focus no smell would in fact never be in focus but mm. smell is always affecting us okay because it's not getting filtered mm. so our brain is actually constantly getting affected by the smells but we are not conscious, conscious of, of that oh so that's why you'll walk past and feel hungry but not know why you may not know why interesting right. so this is also happening to children at the same time right the filter, so filtering this, place. this process is the same hmm. because the brain is essentially the same the child is born with a fully functioning brain except the prefrontal cortex develops slowly over the next 20 years hmm. 20 25 years so a child's prefrontal cortex is not uh, hasn't learned the same skills but an adult's brain would be able to do it a lot more correct but a child's uh, learning capacity is more because so, the brain is still being developed that's why correct so because it is um, it is storing more information and it is making connections faster hmm. so there is one theory that says that the prefrontal cortex development actually comes in the way of learning mm. because we are constantly putting roadblocks in our own learning right so there is like logic an, keeps coming in logic keeps coming in mm. so a child will learn anything right but an adult would try to overthink and think themselves and prevent themselves from learning mm. uh, so there is a inverse correlation with learning and age mm. initially there's a lot of learning mm. and as a child turns into an adult learning might actually slow down and stop right but an adult who has figured out learning can learn even better than a child because now they can use their logic hmm. to learn even faster even better so they have their own system in place for learning right which a child doesn't have which is which is happening instinctively instinctively correct and there are techniques for figuring out learning absolutely okay yeah. uh, do you have any in, in the mind the main thing is curiosity interesting and it sounds very simple huh. but curiosity is the prime motivation for learning right that is the single most important driver most of the adults stop learning because they run out of curiosity or they don't have podcasts or they don't have podcasts <laughs> <That's how laughs> but people with curiosity start podcasts correct <laughs> it's a very simple thing you want to want to learn right and that's the only way your brain will open itself up because this is a high energy pro- process right you know it's a lot of energy to take in so much information uh, classify it put it in its proper storage remember it find patterns why will somebody do that if they're not motivated hmm. so if you are curious an intelligent adult can learn incredible amount of things yeah it said something important then intelligent adult can mm-hmm. learn a, a, a huge yeah. number of things that means that different brains are different like the capacity of learning or intelligence would be different the ca- so i define intelligence as the ability to spot mm. and utilize patterns when necessary mm. 
um so my my take on this is that there are when you know there's this whole discussion on different types of intelligence correct so emotional intelligence right. and IQ, social intelligence IQ, huh, and all, all that so putting it down in its most basic form it is just different patterns being recognized hmm. so emotion is a pattern social gathering social dynamics is a pattern music is a pattern football is a pattern so what pattern are you good at recognizing makes you intelligent in that field interesting that's it so we give these names right but for the brain is just patterns pattern so there might be somebody very good at recognizing numbers but terrible at say asking a girl out hmm. because that's a whole different set of patterns that you have to pick completely right so it is just a matter of which pattern your brain has learned to recognize and use hmm. at the right time right for me that is intelligence so pattern recognition and knowing when to use it and knowing when to use hmm. it anyway coming back to this so when we think about um the children's development right so yeah. there's a point where it ends and then we go up as in like prefrontal cortex stops yeah. developing as an adult we're still learning um oh never stops developing by the way that's oh it keeps a, growing yeah yeah okay. that's like a very feel good factor hmm. that i have always you know found yeah, yeah, <laughs> happiness <are growing>. in <laughs> that it it keeps growing okay. it keeps evolving um depends on how much we push it how much we give importance to it um but the capacity to evolve is very high in the prefrontal cortex not so much with our primitive brains though hmm. we are born with that right the only thing that we can learn is uh, frontal control of the limbic system matlab so our basement of the building and mm. the first three four floors mm. we are born with it right those primary instincts those urges are pretty much there mm. maybe some genetic differences between people but mm -hmm. otherwise it's all there what differentiates person to person is how much the frontal brain learns to control the primitive urges okay So if the frontal brain is different, the primitive urge will do what it wants. So, like for example, control hunger. Correct. Right. Or yeah. control your breathing, for example. Those yeah. kinds of things is, is what Correct. you're saying that you can control. Correct. So the more we lean towards self-awareness, mm. the deeper down our control goes. Right. So most people can maybe control their instinctive urge to shout at somebody mm. or hit somebody mm. because that's like a very violent response that is, in a way, technically natural mm. because at some level our animal. our animal instinct so to speak Correct. is there right. but then we have evolved to control it hmm. so currently when we are driving on the road we are constantly controlling our instinctive responses correct right? huh. but then the more we go into self awareness the more we go into meditation we are learning to control deeper and deeper parts of ourselves uh, so we know of people who can control their breathing who can control their heartbeat hmm. not even i'm not even talking of monks i'm talking of athletes hmm. the uh yeah. last thing on the kids before we move on so what do you suggest parents do when they have kids and they want to teach them habits right like what are the steps that they should follow is there anything that helps them with their brain one thing i've always found is um kids will learn habits irrespective mm. because that's how the brain is wired it is constantly looking to improve itself or make its own survival chances better mm. now there is an interesting relationship between habit formation and stress mm. no stress very poor habit formation mm. very high stress very poor habit formation a uh, sweet spot so there's a sweet spot mm. now earlier uh, there when there was a lot of stress and kids would have to struggle you know to form habits now in today's world i would say that there is a problem of no stress mm. so everything that the child does you know when we say oh it's okay no worries there is a role for that as well but it is also important to know that our brain has to have some push so there is motivation and there has to be some something pulling something pushing correct um so finding that optimal stress level for me is the biggest challenge for a parent hmm. because we are always trying to find that sweet spot hmm. so becoming uh too lenient is also an issue uh, becoming you know very very hard is also an issue um 
in general, I would suggest to err on the side of lenience. Correct. Because over time, life gives enough struggles. Mm-hmm. Uh, enough stress that will come in. Enough stress, mm-hmm. correct. So the child always needs to know that there is a safe space because growth from a safe space is always better in the long run mm-hmm. rather than growth from, you know, like a difficult environment. Correct. Um, so that is one, create a safe space for the child to grow. And second is the importance of resilience. Mm. Uh, in any habit, before the habit is formed, there is a period where there is struggle, where the child is likely to give up. In that phase, it's not that the habit is important. What is more important is that the brain learns mm. the importance of resilience. So that is just a life skill that is necessary for any habit to form. Right. So learning resilience through anything, it is a transferable skill. So you can learn resilience through sports. Mm. You can learn resilience through academics. Uh, you can learn resilience through puzzles, through jigsaws, through games, anything. Mm. But resilience as a skill needs to be taught. How you teach it is not important. Correct. Whether you teach it is important. Mm. So pick something that the child likes and make sure that resilience is taught through that. Right. And then habit formation becomes easier. So it can be sports, can be musical instruments, all these things. Correct. Camping, going out, something to teach Correct. them this resilience thought so that they yeah. can deal with the stress better and hence learn faster. Correct. They will do something. At some point, there will be resistance. Mm. There will be some amount of growing pains. And dealing with that growing pain and becoming comfortable with it, it's the same thing as the breathing uh, technique, right? right? There is that sense of panic. There's that urge to step back. In that moment, if the child's brain can tell itself that it's okay, everything is okay, I don't need to run, I can just stay here and work. And once that moment is passed, then move forward, that lesson is invaluable. Mm -hmm. I think I learned it uh, during my preparation for uh, NEET, my entrance exam. Mm. Because I remember the person that I was before, and the person that I became after that. So there is that point where you feel like you can't do this. And if you just cross that, that is when you realize, oh, I had all this extra reserve that I never knew about. And you realize it was there. And you're learning this as an adult. As an adult. Yes. Right. So from as an adult, how do um, habits start forming? Is it different from kids? Uh, is there any change that takes place? Uh, the main thing that is different is your prefrontal cortex is now quote unquote evolved. So that structure of learning comes in. Yes. Which is what we were talking about, having good structures of learning. The good structure. So the main difference between pa- uh, adults and kids mm. is that in adults, we have more of a, to put it in a good way, we have control issues. Mm. And that control issues come from our prefrontal cortex wanting to label everything, define everything. Mm that this means this, this means this. So whenever any new learning or information comes in, we are very quick to put it into boxes. Correct. Now, this is good because it makes us feel comfortable. It is bad because it might prevent us from seeing patterns in its raw form. Mm -hmm. So any new information, even before we see it properly, has to be segregated. Mm. And segregation means you're breaking up a pattern. Mm. So you're trying to put it into boxes you already know because that makes you feel comfortable. But that also means you're probably not learning anything new. Correct. So for me, the biggest challenge of learning as an adult is preconceived notions. Hmm. Ah, That is where we struggle with. It's not easy to break it because the whole point of preconception is that it's there behind our conception. Hmm. So even when we are thinking... We have to be very honest with ourselves and we have to really be critical of our own thinking to question where is this belief system coming from. Mm. So if you you tell me something and I've already made my opinion on it, will I question myself? If I do, the chances are that I will learn more from you. I might not feel good about myself, but I will learn more. Right. So what is more important, your curiosity or your sense of self-esteem? Mm. And that's where adults struggle with. Right. Self-esteem is so huge yeah. for all of us. 
learning to put aside the criticism the judgment yeah. all those things yeah. that are happening when we classify yeah. and actually just see things as they are yeah right also as part of meditation that's the whole thing right like can you see it as it is without thinking yeah. about it and with your own thoughts on it there's a very interesting term um, that applies to both meditation and interestingly with psychedelics hmm. uh because in the west now there are more res- there's more research happening on the use of psychedelics for uh PTSD and uh you know some psychological d- uh, disorders um and the term is ego dissolution ego dissolution mm. and i was fascinated because i read this in a research paper on psychedelics and i also read this when i was reading about meditation and spirituality mm. also came across it in bhagavad gita there are so many parallels where people are trying to get to a stage where their sense of this preconceived notions are broken hmm. and another word for preconceived notion is ego correct that i am the best right i am unbreakable i am you know uh, i w- i'm always right or i'm not good enough or i'm, I'm not good right enough. which is the other, the other extreme. extreme of this correct yeah. so either way that ego is preventing us from learning new things from experiencing the world in a different way hmm. um so that is the positive and the negative of the prefrontal cortex the positive is that it is very rational it can calculate it can see patterns like nothing else mm. but the negative is that it is so caught up in preconceived notions that it can come in its own way interesting yeah now this is when you are learning habits by yourself mm. you get a partner right now you're right. a couple right so now how does habit formation take place oh this is very interesting Uh, <laughs> my take on love is that when two people start a relationship together or start feeling something for each other both of their brains are undergoing a very unique phenomenon of empathy mm-hmm. where they gradually start seeing the other person as an extension of themselves mm-hmm. so on the first date it might not be so strong um but then as they keep meeting and they keep learning about each other they will start seeing the other person as a part of their own life mm. and eventually a part of themselves so if the other person gets hurt i'll get hurt mm. if i get hurt the other person gets hurt and that's for me that is what love is mm. um which is also it also applies to other forms of love not just romantic love right. even paternal love maternal love mm. your mom will cry if you get hurt yeah. so that is love in its purest form correct so that is what the brain does it extends its sense of self to include another person so in a relationship a couple or how many other people there are in a relationship they will all function as one unit mm. and they will now start learning things together they will start learning a habit together mm. and i've often thought that a relationship is just a collection of habits mm. of how to talk how to communicate correct what are your daily rituals what mm. are your weekly rituals monthly mm. rituals um and so if the more habits you form together mm. the more your sense of identity forms mm. if you have no habits as a couple then there is a question mark on your identity as a couple then right. you're just two people cohabiting two egos two egos mm. correct but if you have habits together mm. that means you have an identity together right which is what a relationship is interesting so your habits are actually what this whole definition of a relationship is what are the things yeah. that we do together habitually yeah correct what are the things we do together how do we talk to each how other how do we talk what are the things we think mm. together mm. um all of those are relationship habits so relationship becomes one person then interesting yeah. i mean and people keep talking about you know we have to make the relationship exciting we have to do new things that means new habits every time yeah. khalas the, like as it is we know how difficult it is to create habits and also yeah. <laughs> so so that's self defeating in a particular way yeah it it, it adds a certain amount of stress but mm. like i said some amount of stress is needed you stress so yeah. there are <laughs> exactly you stress mm. uh, so there are couples who have either consciously or unconsciously figured out that oh having a fight is uh, makes it very exciting mm. so that, you know there are couples who go into that whole cycle of toxicity followed by romance because that's like an easy way of getting that thrill correct 
of course there are better ways and healthier ways <laughs> <laughs> don't fight but this does happen <laughs> interesting so a relationship is a collection of habits of i habits. love this i love this way of looking at it yeah <laughs> then as you grow old what mm. happens to your habits do they stay with you do they start dropping off does the brain de- degenerate like what's yeah. that taking place with age mm. um, there are a lot of changes that happen in the brain uh, networks become slower mm. there are assuming that there is no disease that is affecting the brain even then there are some networks that become slower especially memory um even without a diagnosis of alzheimers or anything there is some amount of memory loss that can happen um there is a term called mild cognitive impairment mm. mci mm. so it's not alzheimers but it is considered as a almost as a normal part of aging where you start forgetting some things that happened recently old memories are all there right you know so this is a very common thing that i see in the opd uh, 85 year old lady completely okay walking talking normal only complaint is that she forgets sometimes she forgets her keys somewhere sometimes she forgets what day it is but the family will say that oh her memory is perfect mm. she remembers all her school friends she remembers where they went to you know she remembers her first phone number mm. and they're very impressed mm. because they think that me- remembering old things are more difficult than remembering new, new things, things. Mm. but it's not like that mm. it's the other way around new memories haven't had time to get ingrained into the limbic system yet not solidified yet they're not solidified yet so it's more difficult to remember what you had for breakfast yesterday morning mm. than your old school interesting uh so those networks start getting affected naturally mm. the good thing about habits is that if they have been around for that long mm. they've all already become ingrained so you might find 80 year old men and women who are following their routine habit just because their limbic system is now taking care of it which is also why when those habits are broken mm. they suffer a lot they don't know what to do they don't know what like to do. at that age if you move them to another place it's a big the habit has gone for a toss in the pandemic we don't talk about this enough mm. but so many elderly people have had a horrible time because they were stuck at home mm. they were so used to going out of the building meeting their friends you know playing cards somewhere just going for a walk in the garden and everything stopped i've had so many patients who've had a su- acute deterioration in health correct for no other reason except that their habit got broken interesting because now they have to consciously think of what they want to do mm. and that's not easy mm. because their prefrontal cortex is not as strong as it used to be and their limbic is still good mm. so because of the habits they were still managing everything but a 13 year old or a 20 year old would have a better time adapting to a new challenge right but at 80 that is much more difficult difficult to do that yeah. what are things we can do to maintain our brain health so that this process takes longer and longer and longer for it to happen the best answer and the most suitable answer here is that the healthiest thing for the brain to do is to form habits okay because i believe that our brain can get used to almost anything mm. literally uh, people keep talking of which is the best diet and right. which is the best lifestyle the best diet is the one that you can follow every day mm. for the rest of your life mm. you fi- figure that out whatever it is that you are doing if you can form a habit out of it give your brain a chance to get used to it and you see the effect interesting wake up at a particular time if you call yourself a night owl be a night owl mm. but can you sustain that can you have that lifestyle for the next 30 years if you can it's probably healthier than sleeping at 9 pm one day and 3 pm 3 am another day you know having that erratic lifestyle is much harder mm. and much more difficult for the brain to get used to so the circadian rhythm is a real thing mm. so just following that same cycle every day mm. is the healthiest thing you can do interesting so follow the habits and that's the best thing that you can possibly do for your brain health okay. it is not eat a walnut because it looks like a brain and, and no. all those kinds of no but if you eat a walnut every day that's fine that's fine <laughs> it will get used to it our brain will break that walnut down walnut at 4 walnut at 4 hmm. fine that's fine <laughs> walnut at 4 <laughs> lovely yeah, yeah last question to you what are your five must habits oof um so i have tried to form one habit in sort of like in each pillar of life hmm. where i feel 
that this is going to help me in the long term. Um, so in the health pillar, the habit that I'm currently working on is sleep. Uh, throughout my residency, my sleep has been extremely erratic. Oh, impossible, you know? right? Yeah, because you know you end up sleeping once in two days or whatever time you get. So in the last two three years, I've been shifting my sleep cycle back to what I call human time. Mm. <laughs> so I'm trying to sleep on the same day that I got up in. So before twelve o'clock. Nice. Um, now in the last three to four months, it has been very successful because I'm up by six six thirty every day. Mm automatically without an alarm so now that that is sorted the the next habit is to get some amount of movement done before 10 a.m hmm. so for me that has become very important it doesn't matter what as long as you move whatever it is you do is fine it's uh, not about gym or swim or run whatever is there a time frame of how many minutes that you set, set so as a what i found is that once i get out i'm not back before an hour hmm. So one hour to hui jata hai. So now I find I'm finding friends who play badminton. I'm finding people who I can go swimming with. I've joined a running club. Mm. Uh, so just finding excuses to move, mm. and then let your natural interest take you further down that road. But before 10 a.m., definitely get some movement done because that's the best way to wake up your body. Right. Um, one habit that I am now trying really hard to develop is a financial habit. Mm. So once a month, you sit, um, and I'm doing this with my wife. So you sit with all your finances, um, not because you kind of, if you don't, then there'll be a problem. But over time, I think it's an important habit to form. And I also read it somewhere on um, Sahil Bloom's Twitter thread, I mm. think, because he was talking about how he developed a whole other relationship with his wife because he started discussing his work and his business with her. Example of couple habit. I love it. Hmm. It's really good. Mm, so I've been trying to do that. Uh, finding one Sunday of a month, just take out all your bank statements, credit card, everything, hmm. and just spend a couple of hours discussing what all happened in the last one month and what are we going to do in the next one month. Um, a spiritual habit that I've been doing is, and this is more of a yearly thing, that once a year read Bhagavad Gita, hmm. and once in three years talk about Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. Because I've uh, or write about it for yourself. Because every three years I've found that my interpretation of the book is changing. Mm. So that is like a personal experiment that I'm doing with myself. Interesting. So how when your life changes, you read a text differently. How many iterations have happened of this? Four. Wow. Okay. Yeah, You've been started, reading this, you're doing this for a while. Yeah, yeah. I started this almost twelve years ago, mm. and I've read it uh, four times mm. in that way. Correct. Till now, um, and. One habit that I've been doing just for my own personal thing is uh, scuba diving. Hmm. So now I've got so into free diving was part of the scuba diving. Yeah, free diving hmm. I just did once. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to see felt how like. I felt hmm. about it. But I'm going to stick to scuba diving. Hmm. I think long term that's what I would really want to do. So I'm on 55 dives now. Hmm. and the 55, wow. Yeah, hmm. the goal is to just keep going, get over 100 hmm get up to 1000 it doesn't matter but a pair of gills that's correct absolutely <laughs> i i feel like evolution took a wrong turn when you <laughs> left the ocean we should have stayed there it's much better underwater and <laughs> see all right we can't do that for copyright but issues that's but. that's something that's very personal to me um, no. um sid i love this conversation with you firstly um where can people get in touch with you where can people find out about all the fantastic stuff that you're putting out because you're putting out so much amazing information I think the easiest thing would be to uh, find me on Instagram uh, and on YouTube. It's The Sid Warrior on both. And um, I have my, uh, I put out content almost every day on Instagram. I think something interesting that I find on the brain. And they can also search for me on Spotify. I have my own podcast. So I would love to have uh, listeners listening in there and asking me questions. What's the name of the podcast? It's called the Sid Warrior Podcast. Sid Warrior Podcast. All mm -hmm. right, go listen to that. Lovely. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the podcast. Sid. Thank you. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. If you like this episode, don't forget to hit subscribe. Also, give us a rating. It really helps with people discovering the podcast. If you like podcasts like this, check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can also watch all the episodes on the Habit Coach Awesome 180 YouTube channel. Follow us on social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, everywhere. You can also reach out to me. I am Ashton Doc at Twitter and Instagram.
You can connect with me on my website, awesome180.com. You can also check out my two new books, Change Your Habits, Change Your Life, and the second, The Book of Good Habits for Kids. I am Ashton Doctor, your habit coach. I V M. 